How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. The word fellowship has a wonderful ring to it. Throughout my faith journey, I have seen and experienced a few examples of fellowship. However, most seem to express being around others, especially when there's food and drink pleasant, present. The examples of fellowship included conversation and sometimes small talk, talk around what one did for a living, who they knew, and what they aspired to achieve in life. And the fellowships I witnessed and participated in did not always seek to include everyone, as there was a who's in and who's out air about them. And these circles of fellowship I knew were always small. And although these circles of fellowship claimed to reflect the reconciliation and the unity of the body of Christ for the common good, my eyes would suffer strain because I struggled to see Jesus amid those fellowships. Rather than fellowship representing the dwelling of God's people in unity, fellowship took the form of divided social clubs or dinner party-like gatherings for personal interests and personal aspirations. The Holy Spirit, well, she also needed an invitation to participate. Michael Green and R. Paul Stevens observe a connection between fellowships that have lost that resounding ring and the state of being closed to the Holy Spirit. They note that the Holy Spirit makes us like Jesus, baptizes us in Christ, produces in us the character of the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, steadfastness, also, the Holy Spirit enables us to worship, to evangelize, inspires mission, proffers spiritual gifts, and fills us to the full. Green and Stevens note that the ring in fellowship is silenced when we are closed to the Holy Spirit. And that statement troubled me so much that I had to reread and read that text and all the neighboring texts to get my head around it. What do they mean that we're closed to the Holy Spirit? Then one day I came across a story. It helped me to illustrate what John's sermon-like epistle tells us about light and darkness, that fiery, passionate fellowship with God that of course is opened to the Spirit and that cushiony sense of belonging sometimes to nothingness. An angel visited a young woman in a dream. And the angel tells her, let me show you the difference between light and darkness, a selfless, fiery, passionate fellowship with God versus a cushiony belonging. And the angel shows the woman a great banquet hall where there is a large table, candlelit table in the middle of the room, and on that table is a large bowl of gumbo. Yes, gumbo. And on the table, that large bowl of gumbo is so fragrant that the woman says, mm, that smell reminds me of my grandmother's gumbo. But shockingly, the scene is one of pain and anguish for the diners at the table appear famished and they are moaning in starvation. They are holding spoons with very long handles and each found it possible to get the spoon into the pot of gumbo and take a spoonful, but because the handles were so long, it was longer than their arms, they could not get the spoons into their own mouths. And the woman shuddered at the sight, sight of their misery and their suffering. And the messenger of God said, you have seen darkness. Then the angel showed the woman a second banquet hall where a large candlelit banquet table and in the middle of, in the middle of the room and in the middle of the table is a large bowl of gumbo. 
However, this room showed a group of people who are well-nourished, they are happy, they're laughing, they're talking to one another. And rather than trying to bring that long-handled spoon into their own mouth, while they're taking a spoon and reaching across the table and across the room, and they're feeding each other. And the woman asked the angel, would you call this light? A fiery passionate with God, fellowship with God and with one another? And the angel smiled and said, love requires one skill. These people learned right away how to die to sin. They learned to share and feed one another. While the people in the first room starved because they, they only thought of themselves. Further, their hearts were closed to the Holy Spirit. They dwelled in darkness, a cushiony sense of belonging. In Acts 4, Luke illustrates how the church, the fellowship of believers, began. He says, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them. We are reconciled back to God and reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body so that we may show forth in our lives what we profess by our faith for the common good. In his work, Guidelines for a Constructive Church, Martin Luther King Jr. argues that the church is anointed to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the gospel to the physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally impoverished, and to preach the acceptable year of our Lord, which is that time when God will reign and all will live out their faith. As a King scholar, I am specially drawn to King's great question, which says, no matter where you go in life, no matter how high you ascend the economic ladder, no matter how high you ascend the educational ladder, in that day called judgment, which is every day that we are judged, the great question will not be how much education did you get? The great question will not be how much money did you acquire? The great question will not be how much prestige did you, the world surround you with? The great question will not be how many honors you received and how many awards you have on your wall. The great question will be, what did you do for others? And lastly, King says, too many are wearing the cross and not enough are bearing the cross. Ouch. And what does what do you do for others have to do with Jesus? Everything. It has everything to do with Jesus. The cross, that place where God's drama hit that high point but doesn't end there, is a reminder of what Jesus did for others, namely what he did for the whole world. And when he appeared to his disciples, he showed them his hands and his side, saying, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Saying this, he is saying, received, he said, received the Spirit, and he breathed on them, which in other words means be open to the Spirit. Do not be closed to the Spirit, because your so-called self-sufficiency will not suffice. The clause following that regarding forgiveness is a what do you do for others kind of clause, as it suggests that forgiving others is what you do for others. It is an expression of giving to others, giving and doing for others. Forgiveness leads to reconciliation, and reconciliation rings forgiveness and fellowship. I wish I had a handbell every time I said fellowship or ring. It would just put a little ring on it. It is not a cushiony siblinghood, but a fiery, passionate circle of light that has a wonderful, wonderful ring to it. 
It is like fine oil running down on the beard, Aaron's beard and the collar of his robe. It is dew coming down on the mountains. And you know, not all the disciples were there to receive the Holy Spirit and to see the risen Jesus' hands and his side. No, the one who wasn't there the first time needed empirical proof beyond just seeing to believe. Thomas needed to touch Jesus. That's right, some of us are visual learners and praisers. Others are auditory believers and praisers. Some have to read and write and engage with the text like John. And some have got to touch to somatically interact with the concept. Thomas, the one who is often called the doubter and the twin, belongs to that latter group. As someone whose research is in fashion theology, that's right, fashion theology, I would attribute this, the title tactile, kinesthetic believer to Thomas. Thomas wouldn't believe as the other disciples did unless he put his finger and his hand in the scars of Jesus. And I will push a little bit to say that He did believe, there was a small morsel of belief in him, but he desperately wanted and needed to touch. He needed to get a feel of Jesus. Thomas was later called to the Malabar coast in India, a place known for its fabrics and tapestries. He was there to share and spread the good news. He started churches there. And he is known as the patron saint of architects, craftsmen, builders, visually impaired, judges, and geometricians. He died when he was struck by a spear. To this day, the people of that coast say that they are Christians of St. Thomas. Noting what he did for others and how he carried the cross for the sake of the common good. And Thomas said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in, not on, in his side, I will not believe. And knowing this, Jesus told Thomas, put your finger here in my hands and reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. This event is a joy to the apostles and to us all, because John says, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And we declare to you, what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Well, John and the others find joy in knowing that they are giving joy to others. Jesus goes on to gently redirect Thomas, saying, Have you believed because you have seen me? And this could also be addressed to the others, but Jesus goes on to say to them, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And blessed means happy, glad, and joyful. And belief or believe refers to a faith that is self-surrendering fellowship with God. As we observe the starving people at that first banquet hall, the unfellowship of self-preservation and selfishness does not express a belief in God. In the second room, the people learn early on that the best way to be blessed and have complete joy is to do for others. The who's in and who's out mentality doesn't have the ring of fellowship, like being with or sharing ourselves and our resources and feeding our siblings with food, words, and deeds of love. 
and I am not mad at Thomas's doubting ways. He was willing to be gently redirected by the Lord for us, for our sake, so that we would come to believe and that our joy would be made complete so that we can look to Jesus Christ and in fellowship with Thomas and all the apostles and all our siblings and all the saints and all the cherubim and all the seraphim, we can say, my Lord and my God. Amen.